Well, welcome to A Cloud of Witnesses. My name is Robert Pears. We are going to do a mini-series on John Alexander Dowie, the Apostle of Healing. In this episode, we're going to look at the Chicago days. In the next episode, I'm going to look at his early days, and then we're, of course, going to look at the Zion days in the third episode. I'm going to be highlighting the healing ministry because that would take this man from being an absolute failure because everything he did, he failed at, until he laid hold of Jesus is the Lord your healer. And he started to preach Jesus as Lord, Savior, and healer. And everything changed. And he went with power and he saw great and incredible healings. When he came to Chicago, and of course he came just before the World Fair, and he puts a fleece out. And I love this in this first thing he does when he comes to Chicago. Of course, initially he was going on to London, but he attempts to Chicago because of a holiness and healing convention. And he's going to present at it. And being typical Dowie, he is going to be a little controversial and, and challenge Christian science. <clears throat> but he puts a fleece out. Lord, is, am I meant to stay here? Because he's feeling something disturbing him that he should now set up his headquarters in Chicago. And compared to a later Dowie, this Dowie prays and seeks God. What are you saying? Is this where I'm meant to be? Is this where I'm meant to set up headquarters so that he could be effective for the Lord God? And he sees a woman get healed of a tumor, um, and he gets that as a confirmation. God, you're, you're telling me to stay here. And initially, he would set up home in just south of Evanston, which is on the north side of Chicago, north suburb. But he would build a, bought some land, uh, I think it was like $10,000 the land cost, uh, and it was by Jackson Park, which is where the World Fair was in 1893. <laughs> I want to show you a map here. As you look at this map, you can see just how big this World Fair was. Very few of the uh, elements of the World Fair exist today. The Museum of Science and Industry is one of those buildings. You can see the Ferris wheel in the background. And you can also almost make out the buildings which would become the buildings that were part of Dowie's organization. He started in this little piece of land close to the entrance to the World Fair, a wooden hut where he built the first tabernacle. And it cost around $2,000. Initially, it did not succeed. But Dowie had been through seasons of failure, but he'd also learned that through the anointing, how to dig in and get the breakthrough. And so Dowie didn't quit. He was a man of great perseverance. He was a man of great leadership skills and strategy. And he digs his heels in and he refuses to quit. And guess what? He gets a breakthrough um, in this tabernacle. He is opposite Wild, um, Wild West Cody Bill's uh, so place of entertainment across the street. And Dowie would ultimately get the revenge on that man by healing his uh, niece. And he also healed um, other famous people. And so people started to come because they started to heal, uh, hear these great healings that were occurring at this white hut. And people lined up and started to come in, and dramatic healings occurred. In 1894, he started his Leaves of Healings. And in his Leaves of Healings, he began to share the testimonies of people that were healed. He gave photographs, he gave names and addresses so that you could go and check for yourself. And that became a very important part of the ministry of Dowie was, look, it's not about me. Jesus uses this vessel and people get healed. Go ask them. He constantly argued, I am not the healer, Jesus is. And if you don't believe me, go find out for yourself. Go ask. And he was not afraid of you going and checking and confirming, and people did. Um, and so he built, or he started a printing press there, uh, very close to that tabernacle in the same neighborhood. He then opened two healing homes on Edgerton. Uh, Edgerton is not renamed since then, and those buildings, all of them, are now gone.
But that was on the south side of Chicago, uh, several miles south of the loop are the main downtown district of Chicago. In 1894, Dowie would start preaching at the Central Music Hall, which was in the downtown area. Now, when you look at Dowie, he was very strategic in his thinking, and he always located where he preached and where he ministered to be very close to a railway line. At that time, the major form of transportation was railway. Realized Chicago had just suffered the Chicago fire. They were recovering, the city was being rebuilt, and um, he now focuses on really reaching people in this rebuilt city by connecting himself closely to the railway lines. The Central Music Hall was one of the buildings that was rebuilt after the fire. It is currently on the site of where the Macy's building is, uh, which of course was Marshall Fields. It's on State Street in Chicago. It is uh, gone now, as I said, and Macy's has replaced it. But it was the first music hall built in Chicago after the fire. So it really was a big step up, and you start to see how effective Dowie is becoming in Chicago, that people are so being influenced and in hearing about this healing ministry. Um, he's always in the newspaper. If you look at any of the Chicago newspapers and even more national newspapers, Dowie was gaining more and more of the headlines. He was often on the front page. Most of the uh, newsletters were critical of him, attacking him. Um, they did cartoons, they did all kinds of things, just really um, criticizing this man who simply sought to preach a message that Jesus was the Lord your Savior and the Lord your healer. Well, Dowie's success continues. And in around 18, in late 1894, he began preaching at the Chicago Auditorium. This was really the pride of Chicago. After the fire, this building was kind of as described as the great pride of the recovered, rebuilt Chicago. And so in Dowie preaching here, it is an incredible statement that he truly now has become extremely influential in Chicago. And in 1895, he's still preaching there. He would be arrested 100 times for preaching medicine without a license. He has become so famous that the state of Illinois would put an ad in the paper looking for people to stand with them and help them prosecute and put an end to Dowie and him preaching medicine without a license. They went after his healing homes, and his healing homes were places where you could go uh, and you would receive the word, you'd be taught the word about healing, and you would receive a lot of prayer, and you'd be ministered to until you received your healing. Dowie was 100% committed to getting you healed. So if you didn't get it immediately, there was an environment where you could build faith to receive healing. And so you could come and you could rent a better room if you wanted to. You could receive food and everything else and be taken care of at these healing homes. They actually built a third one at the tabernacle there, the old white hut, which they continued to operate at this time as well. In 1895, as I said, he is arrested a hundred times. He's taken to court, finally by the Illinois state. And in that defense, he does hire an attorney, but he actually defended himself. Uh, he was an incredibly intelligent man. And in defending himself, what he argued, he kept proving, look, I am not the healer. And when they came against him, he said, look, let's bring all these people in. Many of those people, the people knew, the judges, the police, they knew. And so he puts them on the stage and says, they're testify. And it was through their witness and their testifying that he ultimately was set free. Uh, I believe they find him, but he won the victory. And they weren't able to stop him. And it really became the turning point in Dowie truly taking Chicago. He starts to really become successful. And he then, uh, in 1896, would buy a hotel 
It was on Roosevelt and Michigan Avenue at the southeast corner. It is no longer there. They're now building a condominium building. Uh, and you can just look at the cost of renting a room there. It's just incredible. But he had this beautiful hotel. It's a pretty large hotel, as you can see. And as you look, it is right downtown Chicago. It is right by the Loop area. It's right by the Park District. It is beautiful right there. He's by the lakefront. This is prime real estate today. He is very close to the museums. Um, the art museum was there at the time. He's very close to that. And he's also within walking distance to the Chicago Auditorium. This is an ideal place. And it's right here that people like John G. Lake would come with his brother and get healed. This became a critical place where many people would come and be healed. This hotel he would convert to his headquarters and healing home and his residence. He had an apartment there and you can see some pictures there of inside it was beautiful on the inside. And you can see his apartment there. He had uh, his offices in this building and he operated his ministry for several years from this uh, renovated hotel. At that time period, most hotels would have these big flags, and so did he with this big flag of Zion, and so that he made a bold statement. And that was the way Dowie worked. Dowie was a man that used persecution as a platform. He recognized that when people were persecuting him, their eyes were on him and every word he was saying. So he would be bolder and louder and use it as an opportunity, as free marketing, and it worked because people started to come out of curiosity. And when they came, they saw, because Dali was a man that really believed in testimonies and witnesses. On his wall, you would see all this um, crutches and everything else that he had taken back from the enemy. He saw it as a fight against the enemy. He saw the um, persecution. He saw the arrest as the enemy howling in his demise and making noise. And he saw that as a great honor that he was having success spiritually in the city of Chicago. And again, you know, all the top leaders were coming against him, but he would ultimately begin to win them over and, and start to see that even judges, police officers would start to support and back him. So he's now got this beautiful building. Shortly afterwards, he would uh, renovate a church not far from there on Michigan Avenue, just further south there on Michigan Avenue, as you can see. And this became his main central uh, tabernacle. I believe at a cafeteria that could have 400 people. So just to give you the idea of the size of this place, it's beautiful on the inside. And it was right again on Michigan Avenue in the heart of a very residential area. It didn't quite look the same as it does today, but it is very residential there today. But at that time, uh, it was an extremely residential area of Chicago, but again, very close to the railway line. And it's very close to downtown, so very easy to get there. And it's very easy to get to the healing home, so people that were staying in the healing home could go to church as well. Um, he then opened up his Zion Bank. Um, the, 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 the church was at 16th and Michigan, but he opened up his uh, bank and a college at uh, 14th and Michigan Avenue. So they're at opposite corners. And so he now has on the south, sorry, the southwest and the northwest corners of Michigan and 14th, um, the Zion Bank and the Zion College, where he's now raising up because it was important to Dowie to raise ministers up to go and preach the message and the gospel, uh, both in Chicago, nationally and globally. And at this time, he has got world influence. People worldwide are coming and being trained and going forth. Dowie had a burden. He'd read about a man, um, a young man, that was on death row. And as he reads his story, he becomes so burdened in reading what if we had reached this man before he committed this crime, he would not be on death row. He'd be saved today. And Dowie set up his group of 70s, and they would go and evangelize Chicago. He divided Chicago up into zones, and in each zone there is a central tabernacle. There are Zion cottages, which we'll call them uh, home churches. And in these home churches, uh, you would hear the word. There were people that would pray, uh, have good prayer, and they would pray over you. So you could be ministered to in these uh, prayer, in these Zion cottages. And by being local, 
realize Chicago is a melting pot. There's so many different districts that are, for example, German, Italian, Mexican, etc., Swedish. Dali at that time tailored that local home church and tabernacle to the local community. So you would go in and if it was a Japanese community, guess what? You could hear the word preached in Japanese or German, etc. And it'd be ministered in that style. So he wanted to reach people where they were at. So when you look in the late 1890s, Dowie is an extremely uh, powerful man in Chicago. And he is taking Chicago by storm. Um, everybody knows about Dowie. Of course, in the late 1890s, he would have his war on doctors, drugs, and devils. And it was at Madison and Polina, right by Rush uh, Medical College. And the medical students were actually encouraged to go and be a disruptance uh, at the tabernacle there and stop Dowie preaching. But Dowie is so powerfully anointed at this season of his life that even when they came in with their stink bombs and their attempts to distract and dis to destroy the service, they can't. And you can't defeat Dowie at this time. God is truly with him. He is anointed. He is in his call. He is in his purpose. And he's being effective. And we can learn a lot from that. Because it's critical if we stay to our purpose and our calling, God is with us. And there's an anointing. And that anointing is able to keep us. And even when our enemy comes against us, God is greater. He's able to do it. And that which the enemy means for evil against us, God turns for our good. And that's what always would happen with Dowie. Everything they planned to destroy and defeat Dowie turned around for Dowie's good. Gave him, gained him greater influence. Got him on the front page of a newspaper. And so his ministry now is reaching globally. Um, but he's truly taking Chicago. It's hard to fully comprehend had he stayed to his Chicago mission, where Chicago would be today. In our next episode, I'm going to look at Dowie's early days, what influenced him and his failures, and ultimately how he discovered to be a success and how it turned around. We want to look at Dowie and what can we learn from him. And what I do want you to learn in this episode is that perseverance and that seeking heaven. He sought heaven and he had great strategy in what he did. God gave him great wisdom. And so he surrounded himself with the right people that ran the race with him. Uh, people that had a go spirit to them. Everybody that walked with him had a go mindset. They were go. Go reach the local community. Go reach this city. Go reach this state. And that was part of the burden and heart of Dowie, which I believe is the burden and the heart of heaven. And so Dowie was a man of prayer. They would spend long sessions in prayer. Dowie was committed to you receiving your healing. He would spend uh, all day in the healing home just ministering. He did. Ministering to the people. There are testimonies people wrote later on that got healed in his ministry that talked about how he would spend the whole day just ministering to them, giving them the word, sometimes ignoring lunch and dinner, just to share the word with them, to pray with them the whole day because it was such a burden. He was burdened for the people at this season of his life. It's not about building a city. It's about doing something for the Lord. He's overwhelmed. And he talked about that love is greater than authority, that authority must bow to love. And he felt that the love of God had to control us and direct us and lead us. And we see that in this stage of his ministry. Why is he being so successful? Because at this stage, it's about growing the presence. At this stage, it's about being focused on the Lord. He wants to do what's right before the Lord. It's about the people because, you know, we discover if we love him, we will feed his people, feed the sheep take care of his people. If we love him, we will obey his commandments and we'll go preach this gospel and we'll do everything we can to reach as many people as possible. Dowie did that. He never lost sight of that compassion and that gentle touch. He's a more humble person. Someone asked with the stage if he was an apostle and he says, I'm not debased enough. I'm not, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, of course. I'm not low enough. I'm not humble enough in this upside down kingdom. I've not got down low enough. You know, years later, as we'll discover, he declares himself as the first apostle. A complete flip of this man in the 1890s who is taking Chicago by storm, but not just Chicago. This message is now going globally, as I said, and would also set in place 
people that would soon receive the Pentecostal message and enable Pentecostalism to spread globally very effectively. Dowie is preaching a message that is Pentecostal in many ways. He's preaching on the gifts. He's preaching on the Holy Spirit. Um, <clears throat> his leaves of healings were filled at this time, not on constantly defending himself, not in constantly attacking and saying how this uh, church is wrong and this, this organization is wrong, but really uh, testimonies and sharing the principles of healing and the principles of walking right and holy before the Lord. So this is a different Dowie than we will see later in his life. This is a Dowie that is successful. He's got the right people handling his finances. He's got the right people. He's delegated and he's not putting his hands into the uh, areas that he's demonstrated he has no anointing for. He is staying to his anointing. He's running his race with endurance and he's keeping his eyes on Jesus in this season and God is with him and he's being successful. Well, I pray that it provokes you, challenges you, blesses you, edifies you, and you'll continue to listen. And as you look at some of these buildings, it just would truly challenge you that God could take this nobody from Australia, uh, a nobody when he came to Chicago, and make him somebody phenomenal for Jesus. But as we'll discover in the third episode, there's always the danger that we've got to remain humble, and we've got to keep our eyes on Jesus and not build our own kingdom or derail ourselves from the purpose of God. Well, be blessed, be encouraged, and thank you for watching in Jesus' name.